Good morning, Castleberry Baptist. I'm so glad that we can join together in worship this morning where we can praise the Lord, where we can go and rightly divide the Word of God, where we can dig into His substance. Uh, it is kind of awkward preaching to the lens of Nate's camera phone. So uh, I hope everybody there is getting a good picture quality. Uh, yes, I do look like this in person. Uh, do not attempt to adjust your dial or your focus. It is really this bad. But I am so glad that I could be uh, a part of teaching you in this manner. I'm glad that we have technology where the Word of God can still be preached all the way to your homes in individual places, wherever you're at. And uh, we are blessed despite the times that we are able to have uh, this kind of opportunity where we can still worship together in spirit more than anything. And I thank you all for tuning in. Uh, if you recall last time we had our lesson, we were talking about opposition and the boldness of opposition. We were in Acts chapter 4, and where we'll be today in our text will be Acts chapter 4, verses 23, but I'm going to go back and give you a, a brief recap on our last study, and it was about opposition. Uh, without opposition, there really can't be any boldness. You've got to have some sort of opposition. Uh, we talked about uh, iron sharpening iron, as the scripture says, and uh, without friction, you can't get a sharp blade. So opposition is very important to uh, producing boldness. And these apostles, they, uh, they were in straight opposition of the Sanhedrin. They said, don't preach the name of Jesus. Don't preach him resurrected. And they weren't scared of it. They just witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it, uh, it didn't slow them down in preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ and healing and doing miracles in his holy name. So opposition strengthens boldness. And the ruling of the Sanhedrin, I remind you, was a gift of God. I know it don't sound very like a very good gift when you think about the, the horrible way that Jesus had to die, but it was a great gift because it promised all of us eternity in Jesus Christ. And it was the greatest gift of all time, and it was by direct opposition of Jesus Christ and of that gospel message. And look at it this way, the prohibition against speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus solidified the apostles and the church in courageous witness in a way that could never have happened without opposition. Peter and John had to decide whether to be obedient to God or to the Sanhedrin. And as the scripture says, it is it better that we listen to man or to God, you be the judge, is what the apostle said to the Sanhedrin. And I'm sure all of us would agree that it's better that we listen to our wives, but also we are to listen to God as well. Now that we have that understood, that there has to be opposition, Jesus promised us there'd be opposition. There's going to be all kinds of uh, people who are going to stand against us, what we're doing, what we hope to do for Christ's name's sake. Um, but they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear that message. Because what it does is it creates opposition in their heart. Opposition makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But boldness is a gift that only comes by the Holy Spirit. And uh, without opposition, that boldness really can't shine. You really can't see it. And it says, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, as the scripture says. And the apostles made the right decision. They didn't want to make any decisions based on what their peers thought or based upon what the government thought out of any sort of fear, but their fear was in the right place. It was of what God could do to them. The Bible says, don't be afraid of man who can destroy the body only, but be in fear of uh, God who can destroy both the soul and the body. So they, they, they put all their attention on God's words and his commandments, and, uh, and they stood up against the opposition, the very opposition that slayed God before uh, a great public mass of people. And it was very tragic, but it was a necessary tragedy. Now going to verse 23, uh, through 31, we're talking about the boldness of prayer. And now the apostles, after they had gone before the Sanhedrin, they had uh, stood there to be tried, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't find any way to kill these men. If they could have, they would have. But the reason why they were struggling to find a way to murder these men in the same way that they murdered Jesus Christ is that these men had just created a, a miracle. They just uh, had a man that was 40 years old. He had never walked before and uh, they healed him in the name of Jesus Christ. And there was thousands of witnesses and all of these witnesses, these Jewish witnesses, they were praising God. They were glorifying God. They were glorifying uh, the healing. They knew that it was a God thing. 
and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were afraid that they would lose their stature if they martyred these two men in this way and in this time. But believe this, if they had a way, if they could have found any way to kill uh, these apostles, they would have done it. They, they wouldn't have hesitated. Obviously, they manipulated all kinds of courts and witnesses and everything they could to get Jesus murdered. And even the Roman, Roman government couldn't find any faults in Jesus, but they got him killed. But at this time, it was a particularly different situation. And the boldness of God overcome these two apostles. And they put their finger right in the, in the ruling class's face. And they told them, you're the ones who crucified Jesus Christ. You're the ones who uh, uh, murdered our Messiah. And that's the person whose name we're healing in. And we're going to listen to him and we're not going to listen to you. And we don't care if you take our body. We don't care if you take our flesh because our soul is Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of boldness that every Christian should be living with today. You need to understand there's a lot of things that this world can do to you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to, uh, it's going to, it's going to kill you. It, we're, this is not our home. Out of the ground, thorns and thistles will spring forth, and everything you touch of this world is going to poke you, and it's going to burn, and it's going to sting, and it's going to hurt, and it's going to fester. But it's to remind us that this is in our home, and that should bring this kind of boldness out of you, that you should share it with your neighbors, share it with your friends. We're in a panicked society. There's people out there who don't know what the future holds, and all we have to tell them is that God holds the future, and there's no need to worry now because he knows all things. This coronavirus was no surprise. He knew it was going to happen in China before it happened. He knew it was going to happen in the EU before it happened. He knew it was going to happen here before it happened. He knows all things, and it was no surprise to him. So and our God has great plans for us. But our number one charge right now is to be bold for the name of Christ, to go out there and testify to the world in love and be obedient and let the Holy Spirit fill you, an infilling of the Holy Spirit as you minister unto this lost and dying world. Now, starting with verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all in them is who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord... Behold the threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Excuse me. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father God, we're so grateful. Lord, that we have this beacon of hope uh, sitting before us, your holy word, Lord. Your word says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. So, Lord, we thank you for sending yourself uh, to come off of the pages of this holy book, Lord, to speak and witness to us and to testify as you are a great God. You're the master of everything. You're the master of life. You're the master of this place. You're the master of my life, of our soul, of our church. God, we surrender everything to you. And we faithfully trust you in all that happens in our life. God, we know that you're in control. And God, I'd have it no other way. We'd have it no other way. Lord, I pray that you be with all of our membership, God. Keep us all healthy. Lord, help us to meditate upon you daily, to use this time uh, to focus on you and how powerful you are and how able you are to deliver our nation from these kind of circumstances, to deliver your people from it, God. And I pray that you bring a, uh, a fire amongst your people that ignites a great revolution, Lord, that challenges each and every Christian to be bold and to start witnessing now harder than ever, testifying now harder than ever, God, that we can reach a lost and dying world. I ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, the thoughts of the church were a bit shocking at this time, in my opinion. Uh, the, the response from the church would be best described as unbelievable by the outside world. Here we have these apostles uh, 
Peter and John, and they went before the Sanhedrin, and they were being grilled, and, uh, and their life was at stake. They were worried that anything could happen uh, to woo the courts in a direction that would murder these people. And when they came back, and they come back, I'd imagine when they come back to these people, it says that they got with and that they began to pray with. Uh, it could have been the 120 original followers. It could have been some new followers. But there were definitely a group of Christians that they got back with. And their response was just was wild. They just couldn't wait to hit their knees and praise God. And a lot of us get fed up with what our government does to take our ability to worship away. We're, you know, we're, we, we can't. We can't heal in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to uh, curse our government and we want to curse our circumstances. We want to curse our situations. But here are these, uh, these apostles and these Christians. They got together and they were so excited that they were able to stand up for the Lord. Even though their freedoms were being infringed upon, they were grateful for the opportunity to stand up for Jesus Christ and for his namesake. And, and they, they praised the Lord. And Peter and John had narrowly escaped this imprisonment, uh, physical punishment, even death. And the chief priest, like I said, if they could have found any way to kill them, that they would have. But the church did not respond with fear, anxiety, or a desire for safety. Instead, they went straight to prayer. Church, that is the most important thing that we can do as a body of believers is pray. As we hit our knees until they're bleeding, we reach the throne room of God. We develop a real one-way relationship with God. We speak to him. He speaks to us. And, and we need to get in contact with him daily, all the time. We should be in meditation and prayer. Now, I know that's impossible, but if you set that as your goal, you'll spend more time praying than you will uh, uh, in fear and in desolation and in sadness. The more time you spend talking to God, the more your heart's going to be healed, the more confidence you're going to have, and the more you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that feeling with the Holy Spirit, not the same kind of filled uh, with the Holy Spirit as you get the day you're saved, but a special endowment, a special topping off of the Holy Spirit that helps with ministry. And uh, the prayer time that we're looking at today is a model of prayer for a sustained boldness. We've got to pray like this constantly to keep this boldness about our wits, to keep these convictions under check. And I'm not talking about the convictions of God. I'm talking about the convictions of the world. Oh, I don't want to tell them about Jesus because the last time I did, they blew up and it ruined dinner. I don't want to tell them about Jesus because the last time I did, they mocked me and everybody laughed at me and I was the only person there. No, I'm talking about the, uh, those kind of convictions that we need to, to put aside and you need to be worried about what God thinks. And he says, if you deny me here, I'm going to deny you there. And I do not ever want to be in, the, in that position at all. And in this portion of our exposition, uh, we want to study this prayer and underline the convictions it expresses. Number one. The undergirding conviction of an absolute sovereignty of God. Now, much can be discerned by people in the way that they address God in prayer. If you've ever listened to somebody pray, you can tell a whole lot about them in their prayer life. And right here, we, we're, we're examining our text here in verse 24. It says, Lord, you are God who made heaven. You are God who made earth. You are God who made sea and all that is in them. They're acknowledging God as the master of everything, of things seen and unseen, things told and untold. And they're recognizing him of the omniscient, omnipresent, the all-powerful and mighty God. And you're looking at these people and you're like, wow, they're so reverent of the Lord. They can't help but glorify who he actually is. And the Greek word for Lord here is different from the one elsewhere in the New Testament to, that expressed to believers this kind of reverence. Here it is, despota, and the meaning is despot, or in the implication for the Christians, it's an absolute rule, or a final sovereign, or even master. The faith of the church was that the Lord was in charge of all things. That should be our faith. He's in charge of all things. This coronavirus don't scare him. This economic downturn don't scare him. God knows that these things don't matter when it comes to heavenly things, and it doesn't matter when it comes to godly things. All it is is leverage for us as Christians to leverage the world into some kind of structure of faith and someone greater than them, someone better than them. And it's our job to stand in that gap and to be bold and proclaim to them that nothing happens without God's knowledge. And he can use all things for his purpose and his glory and that leads to the second conviction that we should be worried about. And that's opposition and threats. 
What they had endured had happened to the Lord's people through the ages. We can go throughout the entire Old Testament. Nate's been doing an awesome job taking us through Exodus. And then speaking of the opposition of Pharaoh and God, that didn't turn out good for Pharaoh, did it? And, uh, and uh, they could not just put their trust in people. Their experience was not unlike that of David's long before in his questions of Psalms chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And uh, they, they, they quoted from Scripture. They repeated from their memory uh, Psalms chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And uh, it gave profound comfort in their life. And uh, the church was in good company. God's faithful people have always been in trouble. It was the acid test that these apostles had to sit through when they stood before the Sanhedrin. This was their acid test. Were they going to obey God rather than men? And we wonder if Jesus' words about persecution stirred within them as they prayed. He had called persecution for righteousness' sake. Blessed. You're blessed if you're being persecuted. Now, with a worldly mind, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Nobody likes to be persecuted. I don't like to be picked on. Nobody likes to be picked on. Nobody likes to be belittled or shamed. But persecution for righteousness' sake is blessed. If they're persecuting you because you're standing up for righteousness, then you should consider yourself blessed. You have an audience in heaven that is cheering for you, even though the world may be booing you from the stands. You have a uh, a great legion of angels and saints and God and Jesus, and they're all cheering for you and they're all rooting for you every time you stand up for the righteousness sake. Thirdly, the assurance of God's overruling. We can take anything if we know that God is in charge and will interview. Anything can come our way and we can take it head on as long as you know that God is with you. His name is Emmanuel. He is God with us. The next section of prayer dealt with what, he had, what had happened to Jesus. God had allowed the cross for sins of the world and followed it with a victory of the resurrection. Thus the church could pray. And I quote, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and purpose determined to be done. Verses 27 and 28. And so... Here are these Pharisees and Sadducees and, and the Roman government. All these people think that they, by their power, by their strength, by their manipulation, they had killed God. They're so powerful. But what they didn't know, way back in the Old Testament, it said that God was going to allow them to do this. God planned it. God set this perfect circumstance into existence. They were not in control. They had no control. Just like Pharaoh thought that he had set God's peoples free. He thought he did, but God said, it, the Bible says that God softened the heart of Pharaoh. God was working in Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought he released them, but it was by God's power that the people were set free. Pharaoh was just a pawn in that game. And, and, and here we have the same thing. These people think they're so powerful. They killed a movement. No, they didn't kill a movement. They ignited a fire that is the church and they they can stand, do nothing to stand against it. There's no courtroom that can quiet the voice of God's people who speak in the name of Jesus Christ. There's no martyr that can happen that's going to end this revolution of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that they can do because it's all been pre-prophesized. It's already been set in motion beginning in Genesis 1, chapter 1. There's no stopping it. And, and, and they thought they could. They thought they were so powerful. But something else that we need to know here is that Jesus was not alone when he went to the cross. God was in Christ. He was in Christ and he is reconciling the world to himself. The central source of the courage of the early church was that if God could overrule the worst that man had done and give his best, he could use anything that happened to them. He is able to bring good out of evil. God is. Isn't that good news? Good out of evil. He, took, he brought good out of me. At some point in my life, there was a lot of evil that ruled my life. And today I have a testimony that brings good out of that evil. And there is an ultimate strategy here. We can never drift beyond his intervening, overruling care, which brings me to our fourth point and our final point. The final conviction of the church prayer was that God would confirm the witness of the church with, a, uh, uh, with signs and wonders. He would confirm it with signs and wonders. It would be power, an outpouring of power upon this planet. And... Um, 
That's the great thing about being witnesses of God is that he will, he will endow us with powers to create signs and wonders as long as we're doing it in the name of Jesus and in a righteous manner. And they expected miracles to attend their preaching. I want to ask you, church, do you expect miracles to attend your preaching and your lessons? Are you expecting that? You should, because that's what God promises. There will be miracles. There will be people. Who, the greatest miracle in the world is the moment that someone can decide to quit living for themselves and start living for Jesus Christ. There's a, that's a miracle every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ. And I don't think we should ever forget that. We shouldn't diminish it. We shouldn't treat it like it's not a miracle. It's a great gift that this person now went from being dead to living forever. What greater miracle is there in the Holy Bible that you can read about? Being dead or living forever? I'm getting holy goosebumps thinking about how powerful a statement that is. This should bring boldness from your bowels that you can be in charge of rescuing somebody from the grave and, and letting them inherit eternity. It's a, it's a great, great, mighty honor. And you should be bold for that sake, if nothing else. And they expected miracles to attend their preaching. That's why they preached for more boldness. And that's why they prayed for more boldness and more manifestations of the Holy Spirit's power for further visible proof that God had heard their prayers for courage. Amazing, amazing the way that they prayed right after this situation. We should be hitting our knees right now and praying this kind of prayer, reaching out to God in this kind of way, begging them for more boldness to go out there and stand up against the enemy and to tell them that you can take us and you can shelter us in place, but we're going to put the message of Christ out there, even if it's through Nate's generation one iPhone, which he should update sooner or later because it looks just outdated and uh, kind of like him, outdated. Amazing. They prayed for the Lord to continue the healings, which had caused, had caused such such a problem in this, in this society and the spectacular event spread across the pages of Acts and can all be tracked to pray like that. Now you think about it, they asked for more boldness. What did the boldness get them? It had the, the soldiers come from the Sanhedrin, from the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They laid hands upon Peter and John. They snatched them up and they threw them into a jail cell and they held them captive. And then they interrogated them. And they tried to mock them, and they tried to get them to denounce Jesus Christ, and they tried to get them to do all that. And, and why did all that happen? Simply because they were bold for Christ's name. And what did they do after they were put through that ringer? They went immediately to God's people and said, let's pray for some more of that kind of boldness. I can't wait to go back to jail for the righteousness sake of Christ. I mean, wow. Wow. It's not normal for the church to think like that, is it? No, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think churches should be praying for more opposition. But for righteousness' sake, we will be blessed in that. And it forces us to evaluate our prayers. When have we asked for boldness and for signs and wonders to be performed through us? When's the last time you asked God that? God, use me to bring signs and wonders for Christ's name's sake. Use me to be bold that I can share a gospel message to that neighbor who intimidates me, to that mother-in-law who I just uh, am afraid of, that I can't impress, and, and to anybody. Where are we at in our life, in our prayer life, that we're asking for such things? Are we asking for simple things? Your God is capable of giving you anything your heart desires. The Word promises us that. Think big in your prayer life. The Lord is more ready to give both of these things than we are ready to ask for them, for boldness and signs and wonders. He's more ready to give them than you are ready to pray for them. I promise you that, church. The Lord's answers to prayer of the church is what we can dare to anticipate. Now, the room where all these Christians were assembled, they prayed so powerfully, so mightily. They were in one accord. They were in unison. Their heart was in the same place. Their mind was in the same place. They were dedicated to the same kind of, of way of life. And what happened was an outward indication of the Lord's presence. The room was shaken. It was shaken in prayer. We need to pray so hard that we shake this world. We need to shake this world into a revival. And we need to, we need to pray so hard that we access God in such a way that, that we can feel his presence in thunder and in lightning. And, and that it's not just a, just a, a I think I talk to God. He's going to bring a sign down that says, you reached me. I hear you, and I'm going to answer you. And if you're not praying like 
These apostles of prayer, you're never going to get that experience and you are selling yourself short on a relationship with God that is so much deeper and so much more fulfilling. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness, it says in verse 31, exactly what they prayed for. Again, Luke uses the word filled this time in a passive indicative to show that on this occasion, a special filling occurred and boldness resulted. Now I told you there's two types of filling of the Holy Spirit. There's one you get on the day that you get saved and that one stays forever. It's constant. The Holy Spirit is now dwelling in you and will be in you forever. But whenever you want to go uh, out there and you want to witness and you want to testify, you need to ask for a special filling of the Holy Spirit. One that enables you to be bold. One that equips you to, just like these apostles spoke before the Sanhedrin and they were, they amazed the Sanhedrin with their wisdom. Here we are, uneducated men, and they spoke before them and, and they marveled at the intelligence level of John and Peter, who, who they know had not gone to any kind of college or they were just simple men, but yet they were filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that there was difference. And they identified that difference with Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Wouldn't you like for your your feeling of the Holy Spirit to be so powerful that you don't even have to say, I'm with Jesus Christ, that they can look at you and say, that man, that woman is with Jesus Christ. That's the kind of feeling of the Holy Spirit that the Bible is talking about here. That's the kind of feeling that we should all pray for. Boldness is an outer sign of the possession of the Holy Spirit's anointment. We need to picture ourselves as bold people. How would we act? What would we say? What would we dare to do if we were bold people? Perhaps it's an act of love which we've resisted doing or an opportunity to share our faith which has been neglected because of embarrassment or maybe you're just shy or perhaps it's forgiveness we need to express to somebody or taking a stand and speaking forthrightly what we believe. Most of all, it's following the Lord's guidance with faithfulness, with obedience, regardless of the cost. Remember, these apostles were looking at death, surely death. They just killed Jesus for the same very shenanigans. So maybe it's faithfulness no matter what the outcome, regardless of the cost. Ask for a special filling of the Holy Spirit. He's faithful. Your God is faithful. He'll give us power to act and to speak with boldness. I thank you all for this morning. Brother Bob Penland, thank you for the donuts this morning. They didn't quite make it to my house, but I expect them by next Sunday. God bless all of you. I love you. I miss you. I can see all of your faces right now. Thank you for your time, and y'all have a great Sunday morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, how grateful we are, Lord, that uh, we have the opportunity to know your son, that he would go before the cross and he would bear it, and he would act as the perpetuation for our sins. God, I thank you that I was once dead and now I'm alive, that, that Jesus Christ has paid it all, that I can inherit a kingdom by your side. And as your child, Lord, I thank you, God, for your, for your great sacrifice. Jesus, I thank you for your great sacrifice. Lord, bless my church. Bless my church family. Be with all of our church, God. I pray for a head of, hedge of uh, protection around all of us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you keep this virus away from my family, away from my church family, Lord. And I pray, God, that somehow you find a way to open us up for Easter. I sure would like to see our people again. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.